what's the latest now in terms of confessions? Well, basically, in the book, I did not publish the name of the gentleman who was the chief of security at Cannon Air Force Base because his son was still alive. That's right. Yeah. And he was dying of cancer. He didn't want to deal with the publicity and everything. So the guy's name is Cyrus Eugene Akers, C-Y-R-U-S, the additional spelling of Eugene and A-K-E-R-S. And then uh, Gerald White did something great. He found a photograph of the guy's tombstone showing that when he was born, when he died, and that he was in the United States Air Force as a sergeant. Now, he was chief of security of the entire base. Now, the interesting thing about Cannon Air Force Base is every military branch has its intelligence division or special ops or whatever they call it. And out of the whole of the United States Air Force, the special ops headquarters is at Cannon Air Force Base, you know? Yep. Plus, it's kind of tiny, which is great because it's fewer eyewitnesses, right? And then I remembered an interview that was not broadcast to Bill Casey. Bill Casey said that the faking of the moon landing was supervised by General Sam Phillips of the United States Air Force. And I thought, Air Force, okay, now it's all falling into place. Bill yeah. Casey said Air Force, it was filmed at an Air Force base. And I have no doubt in regard to me being allegedly the number one, we didn't go to the moon guy, I interpret it this way. I think my personal opinion of who the number one we didn't go to the moon guy is David Percy, in my opinion. He's done more technical work on it. Now, I may be a better spokesperson, and I may be better at summarizing it, and I may be better at pointing out spiritual and political analogies about what it means. Maybe that's my specialty. But technically, Proving the moon landing fraud is, I think, David's much better than me. And, of course, what's the name of that hangar, the blimp hangars at Cardington? So it's no doubt that the larger landscape lunar landing fakes, Apollo 17, 16, were filmed there, one or both of them or something. But the first one, for security reasons, this is Percy was mistaken. It was shot at Cannon Air Force Base. We have an eyewitness who says so. And, and that makes sense. They wouldn't want the first one on someone else's territory, just in case. They have to control it, and it was done by the Air Force, and it was done at their special ops headquarters. It wasn't done at any other. Was it done at Wright-Patterson? Was it done at Edwards? It was done at their special ops headquarters for double the security on U.S. territory, by the Air Force, and then at their headquarters of special ops. So the second and so forth after that, we don't know, but... One or more of them it definitely appears was shot at Cardington because you see the same hangar flare of the iron bar structure in the background. Yeah. And it matches perfectly, so that's where it was shot. And it makes sense. Cyrus Eugene Akers said they had two airplane hangars that were already together with a wall between them, and they took down the wall to make it even bigger. It's my personal opinion that... Cannon Air Force Base was only for the television images, not the still photography. I think the still photography, as best as I can tell, because there's so much clear. I mean, the networks wanted a live feed, and they wouldn't give it to them. It doesn't make any sense that they don't take the live feed and plug it into every network in the world, but they didn't. And what NASA did is they projected the image on this huge screen. You remember when projection TV first came out, it sucked. And you can imagine the quality of it in 1969 being projected on a screen with a bunch of lights in the room, having a camera film that, have that go to a monitor, and then the TV cameras film the monitor. Yeah. They didn't even film the screen, you see? So it's deliberately fourth generation. And that way, the set doesn't really have to be that good. To tell you the truth, I bet I could have done an equal job in someone's backyard at night with a spotlight if you give me a, you know, a 300-line resolution black and white camera and let <laughs> me show you my fourth generation copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of it. I mean, you can't tell anything. Now, the interesting picture about Buzz Aldrin with his arm bent, the originals yeah. have the soil brown. 69HC284 was the original, bare photographic number, and then they changed it. But in any case, the original prints that I had as a kid, and if you can get a book from the library or eBay or something 
all the lunar pictures from Apollo 11, the soil is a caramel brown and the background is grayish blue. Big mistake because you can see where the real Earth and the fake backgrounds begin. They later corrected that and everything online, they put a blue filter on the thing and now the soil is blue. This is why I think the Chinese probes are real because their soil is caramel brown. Additionally, if you look at every Apollo picture that has rocks on the surface, and they've actually started correcting this since I said the following in interviews, the original Apollo pictures of all, when there's rocks everywhere, like the famous rock with the sea on it, the yeah. rocks are sitting there right on top of the surface. The Chinese probes, they're sticking up out of the sand because the sand has been falling on the moon for thousands or millions of years, whatever you want to say. Yeah. So in a real picture, the rocks are not sitting on the surface. It'd be impossible. It wouldn't happen. So in the Chinese pictures, there's all the rocks are kind of pointy sticking up out of the micrometeorite soil, which is the way it should look. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're real but it increases their odds. And of course, you don't have to look at one with the brown soil. Look at that picture of Buzz Aldrin, the famous one, and see if you can tell behind him where the fake backdrop begins. Sure. And the way that they did it, they did it rightly so. They didn't put a wall and the real floor like this, because that'd be too obvious. They ran a hill over it, like right before it. The land, and the hill is kind of uneven. So yeah. it kind of blends in better. Now, in my opinion, as a filmmaker, if I wanted to fake it, I would put the subject far away from the wall, you know, which they did not do, which is kind of odd in my opinion. Yes. They're really close to the wall in almost every fake moon picture, really close. Yeah. And when I look at that picture, now I've just got the one with the blue soil, so it's a little harder, but... Sometimes I think the line is here. Sometimes I think it's here. I think what they did is the still pictures from Apollo 11 were filmed in a circular set. And that way they could do a 360 and it kind of looks the way. I mean, the Earth is a sphere. It's not flat. However, I go up to the 15th floor of my building sometimes and look out. It sure looks like a dome. I mean, it, you know, it, it has that kind of dumb look over the horizon right. everywhere. So if you were to fake a 360 panoramic view, I think it would look better if you used a circular set, which is probably what they did. So because the still pictures were much more detailed, probably used a different set. Maybe not. Uh, they could have been filmed at Cannon Air Force Base. I don't know. If you look in the visor, Buzz Aldrin in that famous picture, you actually see an area with no shadow. You'll see a large area with a medium shadow. And that's actually the wall behind him. You even see part of the shadow go up, over, up, over, making two 90 degree turns like it's the wall behind him. Maybe it wasn't a circular set. Maybe it was a cannon, I don't know. Yeah. But there's at least a 50% chance the still pictures were filmed somewhere else, that they were just concerned about the TV images at that time. So now we know the guy's name. And then here's the other bombshell. It's important to release his name now because that's a big part of the clue to publish that. And the other important and highly tragic thing is what Cyrus Eugene Akers confessed first was something other than the moon landing fraud. He was dying, literally, on his deathbed. And as you know, a deathbed testimony has quadrupled the weight in court. What he confessed was is there was a coworker who was going to, I guess, go to a journalist and blab and tell. He had confided in him and said, look, the world should know, and I'm gonna tell a newspaper or a TV station or somebody. Okay. And Cyrus Eugene Akers, murdered him personally we don't know whether he was ordered to do that or whether he took it as his own initiative as the chief of security after all he was the one president johnson gave the list of the vip personnel who were allowed in which is published in the book some of those people are still alive and it was president johnson who entrusted him with that list as the chief of security at the air force's intelligence division air force base so Perhaps he took it at his own initiative. Perhaps President Johnson told him to kill him. I don't know. But he killed him. And that was really the more important thing that he confessed as he realizes he might meet his maker soon and be held accountable. 
And a little side note, I mean, out of all your years of watching the evening news, have you ever seen a single story in all those decades of a bank robber who was at large, or a murderer at large, or a rapist at large, or a kidnapper at large, who decades later came forward and said, I did this, I'm sorry, I turned myself in. There was an employee at Cannon Air Force Base, and we don't know whether he killed them in 1968 when it was filmed or in 1969 when it was rebroadcast, because his son, Gene uh, Gilmore, remembers his dad tearing up and crying as he watched it because he had, that was the second time he saw it, <laughs> you know, when it was broadcast. So we don't know whether the person was killed in 69 or 68, but someone from Cannon Air Force Base in the relatively small town of Clovis, New Mexico, either died under suspicious circumstances in 1968 or 69 or went missing. And so there's a you know, a, a decent chance that we can find out, somebody can find out, a real journalist could find out yeah. who that person is and give closure to the family. I would guess that he would just disappear probably, but the smart thing would be to say, you know, he was run over by a tractor, you know, on base or something. And a little side note, and feel free to publish it as well, the son called the police on his father, at, you know, in the last days of his life because he said, you know, this is wrong. There needs to be an investigation. Yeah. And from what I understand, the military police also showed up. And of course, what became of that, we don't know. They're certainly not going to publicize yeah. a homicide that they perpetrated themselves, much less the reason why they did it. But it caused such a falling out between the father and the son that the son legally changed his name from Acres to Gilmore and shortened his name. He must have been Eugene the second or third. He changed it to Gene. So he changed his name to Gene Gilmore. That's the son whose yeah. video is at sabrell.com. And if you could please just link sabrell.com in the article and people can go to the homepage and view his sons telling his story about his father. Yeah. yeah. So now we have the name of the person can be published and now we have a homicide that's part of the story and you know I've said recently in interviews if they faked the moon landing and killed no one in the process you'd almost to a certain degree respect their cleverness like when you hear about someone who dug a tunnel from the dry cleaner into the bank and took all the gold and got away with it you're like oh, yep. good for them <laughs> you know, they outwitted them there's been a few of those in the UK recently the thing is, uh, we know from Betty Grissom, who I interviewed for four hours, and her son I interviewed for three hours, she told me stuff that she asked me not to put in a funny thing happened on the way to the moon, which because she's dead, I put in the book, and it's the second to the last chapter called NASA's Greatest Fear, because if the truth of the moon landing fraud comes out, the very next can of worms they're going to be forced to open is the Apollo 1 fire, and seeing how the first document of the citizens of America is the Declaration of Independence, not the Constitution, which says when any government becomes destructive of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, they are to be altered or abolished. Well, life. The federal government took our tax dollars not only to deceive us about the moon landing, put it on coins, stamps, encyclopedia, ticker tape parades, and medals of honor, none of it true, they also used our labor from our bank account to murder our neighbors who tried to expose their crimes. This is why the federal government is so concerned about the moon landing fraud coming out. Whoever shot JFK, whether it was George Bush Sr. or you know Oswald, those people are dead. It's a negativity regardless. But the moon landing fraud is a positive, you see? That's why it's harder for people to accept. They'd have to give up something positive. Yeah. JFK murder is negative, whoever did it, so is 9-11. Yeah. But this is positive. This is taking candy away from someone and giving them a turd instead. And they don't want the turd, they want the candy. Yeah. And so when a college professor says that a confession from an Apollo astronaut would not convince him that the moon landings are fake, he'd think they were real anyway. There's a problem with people's minds over this, which is all the more proof that they didn't go. Yeah. When someone sends someone an email, which I've received, 
wishing that they could watch me and my family burn alive before their eyes because I said the moon landing was a fraud. That means the moon landing is some emotional thing rather than a real thing. All that foaming at the mouth and unlogical denial is proof that I'm correct. You don't have to insult somebody to make your point, and if you do, your point isn't valid. And if they really went to the moon, there would be no need for a single documentary or TV show to yeah. prove me wrong. Yeah. That If I went around saying Mickey Mouse was the first president instead of George Washington, do you think there'd be a hundred documentaries reassuring us that George Washington was really the first president? No, I mean, who cares? But the fact is, if they have to keep supporting this, it's because the structure is not sound. That's why, and then, it's in the book in case you missed it, after his son told me these things, yeah. his house was broken into when he was out, even though he had a security alarm, everything about his father that they could find was confiscated, and two days after that, he was threatened with death if he ever spoke to me again. This was less than two years ago. So the federal government is still concerned that the moon landing fraud will come out, I believe, because it will enrage the people more than 9-11, more than JFK, yeah. because it's this candy being taken away and giving them a turd instead. If yeah. that happens emotionally, the public will be enraged. And that's what they're afraid of, that er enraged meant may cause the you know bringing down of the corrupt institutions in the federal government. In fact, when I showed the footage of them thanking being halfway to the moon to the director at NBC News, he said it absolutely proved the moon landing fraud and that he would not broadcast it for fear of a civil war against the federal government. And I'm like, you mean you won't broadcast the federal government's corruption for fear that the corrupt federal government will be brought down? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what is that all about? I, isn't that what's supposed to happen? Yeah. And then 10 years later, there's a new news director at NBC News. And they agree. The footage proves that they never left Earth orbit. They say we're going to buy the exclusive international rights and broadcast this on national TV. What happened? They, can they canceled the program, and they told me privately they got a call from the federal government threatening them not to do it. Yeah. They would pull their license or something like that. Indeed. So that's what they don't understand. The astronauts should have at their press conference said, look, it was fake. They threatened to kill me and my family. Would honorable people in the FBI please surround my house? Thank you. And walk away. Yeah. That's what they should have done. That would have been the smart thing. Hey, if someone threatened to kill my children if I didn't fake the moon landing, maybe I would have done it. I probably would have lied and said, okay, I'm in. And then I would have gone into a TV station that on a live broadcast and then said it. I probably would have done that over actually doing it. All the astronauts were military men. They had sworn oaths of secrecy. Their commander-in-chief was the president. When the commander-in-chief says, jump, they only have one question. How high is Not to, So all that to say, what I've heard, maybe you've heard the same. As you're moving up the steps, I don't know whether it's step 12 or step 3. But somewhere along the lines, in the Masonic Lodge, they put a Bible in front of you, and they say, spit on the Bible. Yeah. And if you spit on the Bible, they say, welcome, brother, good job. And if you refuse, they say, good job, brother. You see what I'm saying? They win either way. What, what they're, they're really re looking for is people to spit on the Bible. Yeah. And Apollo means lie. It means deceiver, Lucifer, that's what it means. So they're telling you it's a lie right on the open. They're telling you it's Luciferian. The moon landing fraud, it's not a lie about saccharin is good for you or bad for you, right? It's about the greatest accomplishment of mankind. And that's why my film opens up with the Tower of Babel, which says we did it to boast. The tallest building and then the largest machine the ship that God himself could not sink. And then Nixon said, putting a man on the moon is second only to creation. When he knew they weren't there, and that's why he didn't show up for the launch. Can you imagine? The whole world is watching. The vice president is there. But you're not there? For America going to the moon to wish them well? To shake their hand? He shows up for the second launch after they got away with it. And that's why Johnson didn't run for re-election. 
I think there's only been two presidents who didn't run for re-election when they were eligible, and he was one of them. And the Democratic Party said, we're going to nominate you anyway. He says, well, I'll, I'll still decline. Because he knew the thinking of the moon landing would be in the next term, and who knew that would work? So that if you got caught being from Houston, Texas, and all that area. And Nixon did not want a picture of him shaking the astronaut's hand with the big smile before the launch in case they got caught. You know, all the more connected to it. So once they got away with it, once everyone believed it, then he shows up, you know? An interesting thing, I, I don't know if you've seen the story which I've recounted a few times about the vacuum of space and the effect that has. The effect it has on photographic film, specifically that. Now, I was attending a lecture in London, well, 2018. It was given by the guy who developed the camera system of the Hexagon spy satellite. Now, the Hexagon spy satellite, which was launched 69, 70, somewhere around there, is only one of two satellites that had photographic film on board. The other one was the Lunar Orbiter. Now, the Lunar Orbiter orbited the Moon. Hexagon spy satellite orbited Earth. They both had photographic film. And one of the points that the guy who designed the camera system, his name was Phil Pressel, uh, said very specifically, he said, we had to keep all the photographic film which we used. There were huge amounts of film in the Hexagon spy satellite. We had to keep it under pressure. A small degree of pressure, about one pound per square inch. Not very much. And he showed the nitrogen gas bottle that supplied the gas to keep the pressure. The film was transported in tubes which are pressurized and the whole thing was encased in a airtight container on the spacecraft. And at the end of the lecture I asked him, I said, you say photographic film has to be kept under pressure, would that apply to Apollo? Implying the photographs taken on the lunar surface. And he said of course it would, film does not operate and work is destroyed in a vacuum. Why is it destroyed in a vacuum? Why? Right. Photographic film is a plastic backed strip which is coated with emulsion. The emulsion is light sensitive. Now the emulsion starts life as a liquid. So it would separate without pressure? Yes, it would separate. <laughs> it would <laughs> basically, you wouldn't have a picture at all, would you? <laughs> it basically outgasses in a vacuum. Uh -huh. Right. Now, right. we've got people who have done experiments with photographic film in a vacuum. The vacuum is measured in a unit called TOR, T-O-R-R, named after Evangelista Torricelli, who's an Italian scientist in the 17th century who developed the barometer, which is to do with pressure. So the unit is called TOR. On Earth, the level of pressure is 760 TOR. That's the same as 760 millimeters of mercury in a barometer. The higher you go, the less pressure there is. Top of Mount Everest, it's 180 tor. You go into space, say at the Kármán line, which is the dividing line between space and the atmosphere, is 10 to the minus 3. You get to the International Space Station, it's tor 10 to the minus 6. You get to the moon, it's tor 10 to the minus 12 i.e. very, very little pressure at all. And the point about that is that you put photographic film into that environment, uh, forget all the radiation, forget the heat, just look at tour, look at vacuum, and it destroys photographic film. We've now been contacted by a professor at a university who has a vacuum chamber that can reduce down to tour 10 to the minus 6, and he's going to be doing the same experiment put a photographic film into this vacuum chamber, reduce the vacuum down, tour 10 to the minus 6, that's as far as he can go, put that film into a camera and see what the images look like. We've already proved that it can be damaged by putting it into relatively low levels of vacuum. Now, if that is the case, and I think, I'm pretty sure it will be, because why would Phil Pressel say, of course the same would apply to Apollo, because he was talking about photographic film the Kodak ectochrome film that all the, film, all the photographs on the lunar surface were taken with. If those are not possible to, to be created because of the vacuum, where else could those photographs have been taken? I think you said it, Canon Air Force Base. 
Yeah, I mean, you could also take the same camera after you do the vacuum test and put it in 250 degrees and minus 250 degrees, you know, exactly. yeah. and see what happens there, right? Same sort of thing. You'll get damaged photographic film. I mean, we're told it was a special photographic film. Yes, it had a thin base. It had a thin plastic backing. There was nothing special about the film at all. It was Kodak film. The camera, the camera was not pressurized. The camera was not pressurized because if it was, you could see that it was pressurized. It would have to be totally surrounded with some sort of airtight complaint. And it wasn't. The Hasselblad cameras on the moon were not pressurized. You know what moon, moon deniers or moon landing fraud deniers will say? They'll say, okay, they must have ruined the picture, so they went in a TV studio to make up for it. <laughs> you know? Well, they can say that. Most of them will, will just say, well, you haven't done the experiment properly. They always find some reason why. What I'm saying, what other people say about the same thing, whether it's Jarrah White or David Percy, Scott Henderson, Robert Williams, all the people who are doing it now, who are looking into it, reporting on it, and it's getting an increasing number of people commenting and agreeing with it because they can't not agree. It's basic science. There's nothing to do with conspiracies here at all. This is basic science. Well, I mean, to me, you can prove the moon landing fraud with that picture I show of it's intersecting at 90 degrees from objects five feet apart. What more proof do you need than that? That's very good evidence. Yeah, I mean, that's all the proof you need. That photograph cannot be duplicated in sunlight, period, which means it's electrical light, which means they're on Earth. Go outside in sunlight and see if you can replicate this picture. You can't. No, you can't. There you go. It wasn't taken in sunlight. Well, what does that mean? It was taken in electrical light. Well, they don't have generators, and they don't have plugs, and they have no need for it. 20 times brighter than the desert, no atmosphere. So it means it was taken on Earth, which means they didn't go to the moon. There you go. Go.